So welcome everyone to the second Q&A of this retreat. Who would like to start? Okay, hi, this is Nadine Hello. from Birkin. I was reading through today's materials and hi, <laughs> appreciating them. And there was uh, in your talk a little bit about how mm, the restlessness is caused by the presence of uh, conceit. And yes, I can certainly attest to that. And you had some ideas that were quite new to me about um, about uh, oh my gosh, it's gone out of my head. One sec. Oh yeah, about uh, the kind of taking what is not offered, um, and the link to the mm, precepts. And this was so interesting because. Uh, yes, relationships that are very um, needy, uh, it's all about trying to control and take and get, and that was certainly my experience for many years in a, in a marriage. Uh, could you say some more about that and the importance of not doing that? And let's say if one wished to be in a long-term relationship, what are the chances that you're going to get free simply because that is triggered constantly? Yeah. So uh, in what you read and what I've discussed about before, uh, I do link the not following of the five precepts to each of the five hindrances. And in this case, as you mentioned, Restlessness arises because of taking what is not given, and that can manifest in different ways. In one way, uh, the traditional understanding is stealing, taking something physical, uh, and that has not been given to you. In other ways, it can mean uh, taking credit for something that you didn't do, or seeking credit when it is due, but then having that agitation arise because it wasn't given to you. So when it comes to relationships, there's always this uh, give and take, there's always this exchange. And that's the whole point of a relationship. But more importantly, there is a certain amount of uh, satisfaction with oneself, so to speak. And if someone in the relationship, whatever kind of relationship it might be, has certain expectations of the other person and that is not being fulfilled, one can bring it up and one can discuss it and talk about it and clear the air, so to speak, and uh, clarify for oneself and for the other person or other people involved how one is feeling. That should be definitely a open channel in any relationship. One should be comfortable enough to be able to mention these things. But there comes a point where it might not be where a person is expecting something from the other person and the other person is very much uh, you know wholesome in their intentions of providing love they might not be able to manifest the way that uh, one expects and even after discussing uh, one might still not feel that sort of emotion from them so that's why, first and foremost, you have to have loving kindness for yourself. You have to have compassion for yourself. A lot of times when someone is out seeking comfort and seeking uh, love and kindness from other beings and from other relationships, 
it's because one is not satisfied in one's own mind. So that's the reason why in this meditation, we talk about first sending loving kindness to ourselves. That should always be the foundation. Um, having loving kindness for oneself, one is able to provide love to others and also be able to understand another person's position. If you are satisfied within your own mind through loving kindness, you're not going to go out looking uh, elsewhere for it. So whatever wholesome interactions you receive outside of having sent loving kindness to yourself is like the cherry on top and it just makes it much more enjoyable. Wonderful, thank you so much. I have a question yes. that is uh, kind of related to what you talked about, and but it's a little bit almost like the opposite. From my meditation practice, I tend to at times become like very flat. And I'm also in a relationship where, where I, it's very easy not to have a view, and it's very easy not to have like any particular cravings or wantings for anything really and this might sound like I, I'm some kind of arant or something and I, I'm, I'm absolutely not so because at other times my mind gives it me away so to speak like it could be very on a very primitive level easily irritated for instance uh, or something like that but also like if I get so if I get a question especially now on retreat do I want this or that or is this or that okay? Or could I do this or that? I'm I'm totally fine with whatever. So it's like what I'm getting here. I think it's like spiritual bypass in a way. Like the shamatha from the meditation makes it very easy not to to kind of like engage or have a view or something like that. Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? And can you comment on it? Yeah. So yeah, you talk about spiritual bypassing. Uh, I've come across that term before, but I'm not really too familiar with it. Uh, but I, I think I do understand what you're saying. Um, there, if I understand correctly, and you can correct me about this, uh, is it that you see that your mind is becoming uh, desirous of seclusion and doesn't really want to engage with people? Or is it the other way? It wants to, but it's not able to. No, it's like I don't have the needs or I don't have the opinion or the the preference. Yeah. Like when asked, do you want this or that? Like coffee or tea? And I would go, well, I don't know. doesn't matter. Yeah. We can have tea. Yeah. And that could become a little bit disturbing for, for the other person. Like, hang on. <laughs> yeah. Give me something like what do you really want? And yeah. It's kind of like a flatness that comes out of the of the if the more I meditate. Yeah, so essentially you don't really have any direction in terms of one way or the other. You just uh, whatever comes your way, you will be satisfied with that. You don't really have any views about it. Is that correct? Yeah. So this is this happens uh, to a lot of people where at a certain point they're just very. Uh, they just see through the emptiness of the world. They see through the impermanence of the world. And so the mind doesn't really have a direction. That's why it's undirected because it understands holding on to anything that is conditioned creates this suffering because ultimately all conditioned things are impermanent. So when it comes to choices as simple as tea or coffee or whatever it might be, it's best to just uh, just to give an answer. I mean, just for conventional purposes, tell the person I, I'd like tea, even though you know you don't really care one way or the other, just to satisfy the other person, because that person could be irritated by your uh, by anyone's lack of uh, definition of what they want. So if it really doesn't matter one way or the other, just make one choice, 
without any inclination towards that choice. Uh, you know, the body has certain preferences when it comes to tea or coffee or food or anything like that. And that doesn't mean that if uh, one wants something or doesn't want something, it's related to attachment to the body. It's just, it's whatever it is in that moment. Um, on a more emotional level, uh, you know, when you see through the emptiness of all things that are conditioned, even relationships, that doesn't mean that one needs to be um, detached in a way that causes indifference or that causes uh, lack of uh, support or emotional, um, you know, emotional wholesomeness. In other words, that equanimity that one might have can be balanced by compassion. So this practice that we have with, re with reference to the Brahma Viharas is about understanding what might be required for every situation and understanding it in a way that is not necessarily, um, you know, being emotional about it, but more about understanding the other person's needs. So if another person requires compassion, one knows, okay, this person requires compassion and one is able to engage with that person. You know, compa compassion can be as easy as just lending your ear to someone. Maybe somebody just needs, uh, you know, to, to talk to someone and you could be that person or anybody can be that person and just be there for support. And if they ask for guidance, you can provide guidance. Um, and then when it comes to engaging with other people, there is something in reference to mudita, which is empathetic joy. You can still be able to celebrate another person's joy as long as it's wholesome, as long as that sense of joy comes from a sense of following the precepts and doesn't, uh, is not unwholesome, uh, is not something that causes craving and greed and so on. So there is a balance there and that's why this whole practice is about getting acquainted very deeply with these different Brahma Viharas. So I would say that when it comes to this retreat, it's really more about coming into uh, awareness of the different sensations that arise when you take the different Brahma Viharas and becoming very, uh, very well versed in these Brahma Viharas so that you can utilize them whenever they're required. Thank you. Delson, good morning. Good morning. I, I had a question around the Brahma Bihara. And then outward, it's, it's easy to think of how you can radiate joy um, and love and compassion, but equanimity is What is the feeling? What does it feel like? Or what is the, what is the purpose of that? Yeah, I lost you for a few seconds there. Can you just encapsulate what you were asking? So I make sure that uh, I know what you said. Uh, when you radiate equanimity, it doesn't feel like it's an emotion or a sensation that lends itself towards radiation because it's the absence of response. It's like a negative, whereas joy, compassion, and loving kindness are sort of active and there's a target, someone's there. So what's the differences in your mind in terms of how they feel when you actually radiate them? Yeah, so let me go through each of them. Let me go through the metta, the karuna, the mudita, the upeka, or as you mentioned, loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. Loving kindness is basically how you would feel towards your best friend or towards anyone you really admire. You have complete faith in them. You have complete admiration for them. You have this appreciation for them. And it's a, it's a friendliness, a general friendliness towards all beings. The same way you would feel about your best friend, you feel towards everybody else. And so 
with your best friend, you you have a certain level of love and kindness towards them. You you have a certain level of uh, understanding and benevolence, and you have goodwill towards them. So loving kindness is that really energetic kind of feeling that you might feel in the meditation where there is joy, there is happiness, there is this sense of sending out all of these good emotions to that person and ultimately to all beings in the universe. As you get into the meditation much deeper later on, the loving kindness will change. It will change into compassion. And this compassion is much softer. That's how a lot of people describe it. It's, uh, it's less energetic as well. It's, uh, it's much calmer, more content, uh, just very flowing. You know, there's a certain flow to it. I wouldn't say loving kindness doesn't flow, but one way to understand loving kindness is, you know, when you, when you're dripping water and it drips drop by drop by drop, or when you drip oil, the oil is very smooth. If you've ever noticed when oil falls, it's very smooth. In the same way, compassion is that. It's very smooth. There's not a lot of energy in it, and it just glides. The mudata, which is empathetic joy, is different from the joy you would feel in the first and second jhana. In the first and second jhana, that is a piti, P-I-T-I, and that is a sort of energized joy that you feel. It's just this. First, it's the joy you feel after having closed your eyes and withdrawn the senses from the outside world. So that's why it says uh, that joy and uh, sukha, which is comfort or ease of the body that arises, having withdrawn from the world, born of seclusion. Then that turns into this joy that is continuous and that continues to be sort of in that same pattern of compassion where it's very flowing but there is this happiness, there's this bubbliness to it. And that is the joy that arises born of collectedness, which means your attention continues to be uh, sustained towards its object. But this mudita, this empathetic joy in the real world, meaning in the world outside of your meditation practice, the way you can feel it is the, is the immediate happiness you have when, for example, uh, you see somebody, you know, having achieved a goal, especially your child, when you see like your child having achieved something, there's a certain level of pride towards that. And you have this joy for that. And so that is being elated in that person's success. So empathetic joy, which means you are connecting with that person due to their wholesome success celebrating in their happiness, the ability to celebrate in their happiness. If you go deeper than that, you can see that empathetic joy is actually a natural progression from compassion, where loving kindness is all about sending benevolence and happiness to others. Compassion is wishing that their suffering would end. You want them to stop suffering. You want them to experience the cessation of suffering. Of course, this is important to understand for practical purposes when you're out in your daily life, that compassion is not the same as sympathy. Compassion is the ability to be there for a person and when they are in pain and wishing that they come out of their pain, giving them the guidance and the support, giving them the emotional guidance and the support, but at the same time, helping them in a way that helps themselves come out of that suffering. So you don't be a crutch to them. You would just be someone who helps them foundationally in some way, whether it's just lending a year, whether it's just providing advice or whatever it might be, but you don't solve their problems for them. Think about it for your own self. Would, it, would you really learn anything if somebody else solved your problems? Would you actually have any insights that arise if somebody else tried to solve your problems? So in the same way, you want that person to grow on their own. This is compassion. Equanimity is a much, much deeper level of balance of mind. So compassion, mudita, or empathetic joy and loving kindness uh, does seem to be more outward. 
It seems to be more oriented towards other beings. Whereas equanimity has to do more with your inner state of being more than anything else. So the natural progression there is when you get into nothingness. Why do you get into nothingness? It's because you start to see the impermanence of the sensory consciousnesses that arise. You start to see that this becomes tiresome. So you're seeing dukkha, suffering firsthand. And you see that it's an impersonal process. The revelation of this, as it becomes deeper, naturally progresses the mind into nothingness, where the mind realizes, I belong to no one and no one belongs to me. There is no self present that is all pervading and permanent. So this nothingness is really the nothingness of seeing that there's nothing here worth holding on to. And so because of that, the mind becomes very calm and becomes very balanced. It's not detached, it's non-attached. Because detachment means that you were attached before and you're detaching from it. Here, the mind was never attached to begin with. It's non-attached, meaning it doesn't either detach nor attach. It's just seeing things clearly. Equanimity is about seeing things clearly, seeing reality as it actually is, without mind becoming swayed one way or another. Now, how does one irradiate this equanimity? It's more than a radiation. It's, uh, it's, it's a very soft, gentle push. And that's the kind of uh, metaphor that I like to use, which is you have a very clear lake and you take a little pebble and you drop it into the lake and you start to see the ripples. So it's not as active in the way of, let's say, uh, radiating loving kindness or compassion. It's just watching these waves of equanimity go. And the equanimity you're feeling is this very strong, balanced mind where you're not disturbed by anything. And it's not indifference. Indifference is where you're actively ignoring something that makes you feel bad. And by doing that, you actually have aversion and resistance to it, which causes more craving. Here, you're seeing the unpleasant situation for what it is, but you don't get disturbed by it. Thank you. Dalton, I had a question, if I may. Yes. Um, as we progress through the, uh, the different stage of the meditation, the uh, parts of the body start to disappear in terms of sensation. And it seems that happens at the extremities and then kind of almost moves up the body until you're left with the head and then in between that a liminal place between sort of neither perception nor non-perception and cessation, you, that, that goes as well. And there's, there's no nothing at all. But I just wonder if you have any comment as to why that why that pattern of disappearance happens in that particular way. Is there a, is there a reason for that? Yeah. Uh, when you look at uh, a sutta like, for example, the Kamabhu Sutta, or even the uh, Majjhimanikai 43 or 44, the, the greater discourse in the questions and answers, or the shorter discourse in the questions and answers. In one of those, of those two, it talks about how the formations are tranquilized. Now let's understand the formations and how they're being tranquilized. There is the physical formations, there is the verbal formations, and there is the mental formations. When you progress through the path of the jhanas, when you go through each of the jhanas, you are tranquilizing these formations in a particular order. When you sit down for your meditation and you close your eyes, you cut off the visual sense around you. You are now just meditating. You are now being mindful of the body and the present moment and so on. And you cut off any feeling of sight. You cut off the feeling of visual sight in the external world. And you stop, you don't say anything, you don't speak. So you have ceased any kind of speech that could arise due to verbal formations. 
this is just a very gross form of it. That's just a very coarse form of tranquilizing. As you get deeper, when you get into the second jhana, so in the first jhana, you're doing some form of application of thought. You're, you are sustaining the feeling of loving kindness through verbalizations, through imagination, through visualizations, whatever it might be. But once you get a hang of understanding the feeling and being able to sustain your attention on that feeling, your verbalizations cease. And so now you are further tranquilizing the verbal formations when it comes to thoughts, when it comes to verbal thoughts in the form of words and so on. And then as you get into the third jhana, your breathing also slows down. And this is because the mind is becoming calmer. And when the mind becomes calmer, so does the body. The body requires less respiration. It requires less of its metabolic activity and it starts to slow down. And when this happens, you are tranquilizing the bodily formations further. They're tranquilizing the breath, not consciously. It's just because your collectedness is becoming more unified, not becoming absorbed, but more unified and able to stay on its object for longer periods. As this happens, parts of the mind, or let's say the brain, start to also calm down. And there is a certain part of the brain, what, what is known as the the parietal temporary temporal lobe. It's somewhere around here. This starts to calm down even further in the fourth jhana. And they say there is the cessation of breath in the fourth jhana, but it's really, the breathing becomes almost imperceptible. You don't really pay attention to your breath at all at this point. So it's further tranquilizing the bodily formations. At this point, there's no verbal formations that are active. There are still mental formations in the form of feeling and perception because you might, you might have some sensory impact that arises. And as you get deeper into the practice, when you get into the fifth jhana or what is really the dimension of infinite space, this is a result of the different parts of the brain that are calmed down, that the sense of self starts to wane away. And so this idea of a border point between the body and outside space uh, becomes further reduced. So you don't really feel like there's any division between what you could call yourself and the world outside. And the spaciousness starts to be more uh, experienced. It starts to be more noticeable, more perceptible. And then as you get deeper, you start to now deal with the mental formations at the level of infinite consciousness. So that those mental formations have to do with feeling and perception. You still have perception there. You still have feeling in the way of mental contact. When you see the different uh, like visual contact or visual consciousness, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, or whatever way you might experience it in, in the way of flickering or different other ways, you're still experiencing those, but then those start to calm down even further. Then in nothingness, you still perceive that there is a sense of nothingness. There's still perception there. When you get into neither perception or non-perception, there are points where the mind seems to have slipped into some kind of unconsciousness just for a few, few moments and it comes back out. And this is where the, the perception aspect of the mind starts to shut down. It's starting to shut down and it starts to become more diminished until finally when you have everything in balance and you're just watching the quiet mind for some period of time, because there is no more reflection, because there is no more perception that is dependent upon feeling, uh, because the mind has become so calm, so tranquilized, and there is no attending to the formations, because the formations that you see in either perception or non-perception, they will arise insofar as there's perception. So the perception will notice those formations. But if your mind lets go of them and comes back to quiet mind, the formations will still arise, but because there's no, there's nothing to fuel it in the way of your attention, they will just drift out by themselves. Eventually, when they all just tranquilize, when they all cease, 
you have cessation of perception and feeling. So just a further question on that same point, Dalson. Um, you can obviously, you can meditate in very, very bright daylight and then in a completely dark room. And, and the, certainly the first part of the meditation, in your observing mind, it looks different because of the effect of the increase of light. But then uh, regardless of the external light, when you get into that nothingness and so forth, it all looks the, pretty much the same. Is that because the six sense bases have kind of shut down Yes. The, the, the effect of, yeah. Yeah. I'll also say one thing about uh, the perception of light. Um, if you ever feel tired or if you ever feel like you have less energy uh, and the mind seems to drift into slot and torpor, get into a place where there is, if you can, natural sunlight, especially natural sunlight, because that has an effect on the mind. And the Buddha talked about this in the way of internal perception of light as well. But uh, it matters more that you have some form of light around you because it, it, it can be difficult to have that inner perception of light. That would require deep amounts of concentration and that's not really the exercise here. The exercise is to allow the mind to be uplifted when there's slot and torpor. So that's just an aside. But yes, when it comes to whether you are in a well-lit room or in natural sunlight or wherever you might be, the six sense bases do shut down. Uh, they do start to minimize, in, especially towards nothingness, and then they completely shut down for some time in either perception or not, uh, in cessation of perception and feeling. Delson, I just have a question you just said about inner perception of light, right? So um, for me, it's like I kind of like notice always in probably between, well, you know, it's based of nothingness. I can see my, you know, although I'm you know normally sitting in a room that's a, not too much light, um, but there's there's some light to it, but it's much more brighter. Mm. Is is that what you are um, referring to? Is that mean like am I getting into you know a very concentrated kind of mind? Because like I, lately I notice myself I'm intend to go towards that instead of collectiveness. Yes, you want to stay away from the light. Okay. Uh, as you know, I mean, basically, when you have that perception of light, the mind becomes too collective, it becomes, it starts to become one pointed. And then you'll have that perception. Sometimes people have have that perception of light in the fourth jhana or the fifth jhana. And that's just because the mind has become so quiet that it, the meditator forgets to stay with the object, and it becomes too concentrated. So when that happens, uh, what I would suggest is when you notice that perception of light, let that go using the six hours and come back to say equanimity or whatever your, your object will be. Because these are also part of uh, formations in one way or another. It's, it's a manifestation of formations in which the mind, having made contact with this very strong absorption, uh, manifests as this light. So those formations that arise because of it then give rise to this perception of light so I would just say, treat it as another hindrance, treat it as another uh, distraction that one has to let go of, and then come back to just the perception of equanimity and radiating equanimity. 
it's like I just want to distinguish a little bit though. I know it's it's not the Nimidas because I know I, I I'm familiar with the Nimidas uh, uh, with my previous you know um, type of meditation. It, it wasn't like that, but it just like you know all my surrounding become like so bright. Mm -hmm. You know uh, that oh, yeah that is in, I guess another form of uh, perceptions of light. I guess. Yeah, it, basically what we're, what the, see, even if you do experience perception of light, the whole point here is the cessation of perception. So even if you do see things like this, whether it's in infinite consciousness or in nothingness, it's important to see this as another form of perception, another form of uh, sensation and perception. What we're doing here is quieting down all of those faculties. So if you do notice it, then consider that to be a distraction, nimitta or not, whether it is nimitta or not in nimitta, it's better to let that go because what you want to come to is the cessation of perception and feeling. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, Delson. Hello. So actually, I've got a few questions. So like you were mentioning all the things which happens during the various jhanas, but uh, it doesn't happen all the time. Like we, the feeling might be there, but all the symptoms which you told doesn't actually arise, or maybe I'm not feeling it. Is that something which I should be worried about? No, you should not worry at all in this retreat. Don't worry at all. Uh, can you give me a specific example? Uh, say, okay, there are a lot of examples, so I'll give you a couple of them. So first thing is, if there is joy, there will not always be that I am sensing all the, like the infinite consciousness at the same time, like all the flickering of the consciousness. Yeah. yeah. And also at some times when I even have compassion, like uh, in between, I still have verbal formations arising, which helps me keep the feeling going. So even then, like okay. the verbal formation should end at the second jhana, but I'm feeling compassion and at times the verbal formations arise and then yeah. they cease again. Yeah. So let's take uh, the example first of infinite consciousness and uh, joy. The thing about this is it can manifest in different ways. So it could be that it's it's not it might not manifest in the way that you hear about it with the light, with the lights flickering in the eyes or the tapping in the ears. It can manifest in different ways. Some people feel sort of like an itchiness on the face or the skin. Uh, some people feel like a, like electricity in their tongue, you know, or some people can smell phantom smells. It can manifest in different ways. It's not always going to be the same. But my suggestion here is don't look for it. Just continue being with the joy and allow your mind to remain with that joy. Some people bypass infinite consciousness without even knowing that they were in infinite consciousness. Uh, so sometimes the suggestion is to go back and just see what you might have missed in your meditation and notice if there was anything you saw that was likened to be infinite consciousness. So if you are in joy, just stay with the joy, continue staying with the joy and just watch what's going to happen. Don't watch for it, just watch it, just observe it, you know, just lay back and observe it in your mind. Now, in terms of verbal formations, my, my recommendation is start without the verbal formations. So what's going on here is you are in the first jhana when you start off. It just gradually happens that you get into the fifth jhana, so to speak, if you're starting with the verbal formations. But if you start with just this sense of sending out the loving kindness or the compassion, you're still starting off from the second and third and fourth jhana. It's just you don't know it yet. Um, this in, initial application of thought 
this effort that is being made to go into the fifth jhana, which is to say this radiating, this effort of radiating still means there's an initial application of thought. So yes. the only difference here is rather than taking a longer time to go from the first to the fourth jhanas and then experiencing infinite uh, space, it just takes a few minutes or it could take 10 minutes, it could take 15 minutes, whatever time it's going to take, but it will definitely take a shorter amount of time than it would have been when you were going from the first to the fourth jhana. You see, you're always going through the first and fourth jhana, even when you apply the thought of going into infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, neither perception, non-perception. There's always intention that starts, starts it off. Because what you have to understand is there is only four jhanas. There is four jhanas and there's four ayatanas. These four ayatanas, which are known as fears of experience or perception, are uh, resting on the foundation of the fourth jhana. So whether you're experiencing infinite space, infinite consciousness, or nothingness, or neither perception or unperception, you're doing it on the basis of the fourth jhana. It's an extension of the fourth jhana. So you will always be starting out with these first four jhanas, but it will take less time for you to get to that experience of infinite space, for example. Okay. Uh, one question regarding practice. Actually, I've got four questions over here. So the second question I've got is, uh, like in, when I'm in nothingness and uh, that stays there for some time, it gets a bit dreamy, like, and then it uh, stays there for some time and then it's again, there's nothing again. So is that something uh, I should six hour and it's dullness basically, right? So let me ask you this, does the mind feel dull? Does it feel uh, like it's uh, starting to fall asleep or is there still attention there? Is the mind still uh, medical? There is attention there. Hmm. Seems like, yeah. Yeah. So you experience the nothingness and what you're getting towards now is neither perception or non-perception. But I will, okay. Go ahead. Okay, so yeah, it's just a bit different, that's all. <laughs> yeah, maybe you want to give more description of what it is. It's just happened a couple of times. It hasn't happened many times. So it's not like I have a lot of experience with it. So. The beginning of neither perception nor perception. A lot of people will describe it in this way, where the mind is still alert, it's still awake but there's this dreaminess to it. There might be certain images that come up or, you know, it feels like you're dreaming, but you're still awake. So it could feel like a lucid sleep or a lucid dream. This is really the beginning of neither perception and non-perception, what you're talking about, if your mind is still alert. Yes, it is still alert, yes. Yeah. So then in that case, you start off with uh, whatever the mind feels like it wants to start off with, whether it's compassion or joy, and just allow the mind to go back to that place. Don't look for it, don't push for it, don't do anything like that. And try to sit for longer periods. So because now you're going to allow the mind more time to unfold, to unravel itself. Yeah, and the next question is exactly desire to progress. <laughs> like, how do I do it? <laughs> There's so much desire to progress. But you, you're not uh, paying attention to how much you've already progressed. Do you see how much you've already progressed? Yeah. <laughs> right? So yes. before you try to look for more progress, just pay attention to where you are at in relation to where you were maybe two days ago or three days ago, right? Here, the whole intention of this is to really get in touch with the experiences. You want to play around with it. You want to, you know, you want to be like a engineer, like, like just taking the mind apart and watching what's going on. Don't look for, you know, entry into Sotapanna. Don't look for enlightenment. Don't look for Nibbana and all of that. If you just look at the mind, look how the mind is responding when it's in the sixth jhana, in the seventh jhana, in the eighth jhana, and notice 
the different things that are arising and passing away. Go back to Majjhima Nikaya 111, Anupada Sutta. There Sariputta is talking about the different factors that he's noticing. Now, here's the distinction. You don't want to look for them. You're just watching them when they arise. So your mindfulness is becoming sharper when you're doing that. Don't look for what's going to happen next. The moment you do that, you're going to stop. Nothing's going to happen. The craving will arise and it will just continue to spiral into more frustration and restlessness and agitation. Instead, really take your time with understanding if you're in the seventh jhana, what is the seventh jhana? What is this equanimity? What is this nothingness? What are the different elements to that particular jhana? What are the different factors in that particular jhana? What are you feeling? Where is the mind? Is there contact? Is there feeling? Is there perception? You're not looking for them. You're just observing what is happening. And you're using the six R's whenever your mind becomes distracted and drifts away and then comes back. The more you do this, the more you just have that sort of open uh, mind, that nature of a mind that is naturally just tinkering with things and just seeing how things come and go, the easier you're going to fall into the eight jhana and the easier you're going to fall into cessation of perception and feeling. Mm. Seems like I should apply the mind like I used to play a video game. So it seems like that. Exactly. There you go. You know, when you're in a video game, whatever video game you're doing, you're exploring different places. You're really curious about what is this place? What is that place? Right. But remember, yeah. I have to give you that caveat. Don't go exploring too far that you drift away from your object. Okay. And uh, the last question, like during the last interview, we were, discussed, we were discussing about the arising of suicidal thoughts. And we told you we'll explain it in detail uh, during this. Oh, it's just and suicidal thoughts, right? Yeah. 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 So, why, yeah. Why does a person want to commit suicide? They usually have the sense that there's too much tension going on, They're, they feel very pressured the impact of everything going on around them in terms of sensory experiences, in terms of mental experiences, they feel very pressured. They feel like there is this unbearable weight over their shoulders, unbearable pain on their shoulders. And there's this sense of self that wants to end it all. And the reason is because they have equated themselves to that pain, equated themselves to feeling that pain. When a person is feeling suicidal, you have to first calm them down. Just let them relax first. Actually let them physically relax. Make them notice why this is arising. Make them notice that this is arising because of something that they have held on for too long. When you hold on for something too long and when you have certain expectations of yourself, when you hold all of these standards for yourself where it becomes unbearable, you see there are these three expectations people have. They have expectations of themselves that I have to be this way, I need to achieve this, I need to be successful, or other people need to behave in a certain way with me. Other people need to treat me a certain way or the world at large isn't the way that I want it to be. When all of this spirals into different thoughts, it causes a mind that becomes too pressured. It causes too much tension. And there the person just wants to end it all. So you have to first sit them down and ask them to physically relax, take a few deep breaths and walk them through it. It's a very delicate process. It's a very delicate procedure because their mind is very disturbed. But when you're talking about the causes for suicidal thoughts and the causes for suicidal tendencies, this is really one of the reasons when it comes to behavior and responses and reactions with the outside world. Another would be, you know, medical, which I'm no expert in. So it could be something related to the chemicals in the mind, in the brain, uh, related to other things. I can't comment on that. What I can comment on is what I have seen when people do feel like, or when they say, I want to kill myself, is that they feel very pressured. And that's where they require compassion. They require understanding. They require themselves to go into a forgiveness practice, to forgive themselves for having these high expectations. 
forgiving the world around them and forgiving anybody that comes into their mind. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Delson. Um, Delson, I was um, wondering, you know, uh, the Tibetan term Rigpa, how does that, um, where does that fit into this practice or does it not or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, you're talking about like Tibetan Buddhism, like Vajrayana and the different practices that they have. Yeah, I mean, very basic knowledge from having read the book of the living and dying, the Tibetan book of the living and dying. So Tibetan, uh, as much as I understand and have read a little bit about the history of Tibetan Buddhism, it evolved in uh, parts of Tibet, of course, but it originated in northern India, where there was a lot of other traditions there. Uh, there was the, uh, they call it the Perm tradition. It's, it's I, I believe it's called the Perm tradition. It's spelled B-O-N, uh, but it's actually pronounced Perm, if I'm not mistaken. And they incorporated all of these other traditions into it. But the very core of Tibetan Buddhism goes into this natural clarity of mind, this natural awareness of mind. And what that is referring to is the quiet mind, that radiant mind that you feel in neither perception nor non-perception. And they have a lot of different kinds of practices related to creating like a rainbow body and things like that, which I can't really comment on. When it comes to the book of the living and the dead, when it talks about the bardos, it talks about different spheres of existence between one existence and the other existence. But that all is happening in the mentality of an individual still uh, in this particular life. So if we take an example of somebody who is uh, about to pass away and let's say they have certain attachments uh, they still have certain desires, there's still formations that arise, which the mind holds on to, it can then give rise to a new existence. Now, for, for clarity and for simplicity's sake, let's say that that being, it was a human, and then goes into another human existence. That period between one existence and the next existence, the Tibetan Buddhist uh, Buddhism uh, school really explores that in terms of bardos and what's happening in the mind. But here in this tradition of Theravada, for example, it says that there is spontaneous rebirth, which means there's no interperiod between one existence and a birth into a new existence. So that does not invalidate the bardo experience. What that's saying is those bardo experiences where a being is experiencing all the different things that happen in that interperiod is actually happening within the mind of the being who is about to pass away or who is passing away. And in that point, when you get to the level of formations, time is a very tricky thing to measure. And you could obviously experience it in your own meditation where you go so deep in your meditation that you think you've only meditated for like five minutes and a whole hour has passed. The inverse of that is if your mind is too agitated, you feel like you know you've only pra you've practiced for like an hour, but only ten minutes have passed. So time at this level is very tricky to really be able to be able to uh, m make it consistent, you know, as compared to how one might feel in this existence right now. Even there, time is relative. But here at the level of formations, when you're talking about the bardo experience in the mind, it could feel like the mind is experiencing all of its different uh, memories throughout its life in the span of one moment. Or it could feel like it's going through different phases of life or different portals and dimensions and things like that. But all of this is happening in the mentality 
And what happens is there are these three things that happen. It could be a karmic sign. It can be a sign of destiny, which is what one holds onto, which can, which can create the new existence. Or it could just be a regret that a person has that they hold on to. Anytime they hold on to a formation, they, that consciousness that is driven forward will then give rise to a new existence. So the Bardo experience is not invalidated. It's just understood as being still present in that mentality of when a person is dying. All right, Dunson, may I ask one more question? Yes, of course. Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, Bhante Vibraramsi talks a lot about intuition, but how does that come into the framework of the practice? How does that uh, always come to? Is it something to do with the soul or God or something? No, not at all. Intuition is, it's much deeper than thought. It's much deeper than reflection and analysis. It's basically as simple as this. Let's say you're trying to find an answer to why you're not continuing on with the practice. You might have a roadblock in your practice for some reason, and it's not really aware uh, to you. You're not really uh, clear on what that roadblock might be. So you ask a question to the mind, what is the reason for this? And you let it go. You just completely let it go and continue doing what you're doing. And then out of nowhere, the answer will come to you. And this is from the inner workings of the mind on, let's say, the subconscious level, which is at the level of formations and so on. They just arise on their own, having explored this question without your input, without your conscious, reflective, analytical input. And the answer will be so clear it can feel like as if it's a voice that tells you that, or it's just an impression of a mind that tells in the mind that's like, ah, okay, I get it. It's that eureka moment. That's really insight is that eureka moment, which is not uh, dependent upon conditions. Yes, there are conditions that led to it, but it doesn't arise because of effort. It doesn't arise because of immediate effort in that moment. It just happens on its own. So the easiest way and the simplest way I would say to exercise intuition is to ask the mind a question and don't think about it and do something else. And then at some point in time, uh, it'll just occur to you what needs to be done. Okay. Yeah, because I was thinking that maybe that, that is related to the Atman concept in Brahmanism or something. <laughs> no. It can be explained in this way. Yes, I mean, in, in Brahmanical traditions, they have the concept of Atma and it's like your, your Antaryami, right? They call it the inner yes. self that uh, comes up and then gives you the answers. But it can be understood as saying that your mind now has something that it's working on, on its own, somewhere else, with you doing something else. And the formations that arise then give rise to this particular answer. But these formations are not applied by mental effort. It's not applied by mental reflection. These, these formations will just bubble up and then provide some kind of thought in the form of, let's say, an image or just a voice or just like this thing, just this idea that you get. You can't really verbalize the idea. It's just this, okay, I get it. I have to do it in this way. You just get a feeling, you just get this knowing that, okay, this is what I need to do, or this is what the mind needs to do in order to let go of that roadblock. 
yes it does uh, get explained in this way thank you Delson, the um the Zen Buddhists, they, they talk about these different levels of enlightenment and they refer to the ox pictures, the, you know, the Satori and, the, and so forth, or Kensha, I think they call it. Are they, are they comparable to the, to the uh, stages of uh, enlightenment that we're talking about when doing this practice? I wouldn't say so uh, because, well, I would only say this because of only the information I have about Zen Buddhism, but as far as I understand it, when you have the ox pictures and so on, it talks about different stages. But I don't know if you would compare it to the four levels of awakening within this tradition. Because as I understand this tradition, and as I, I have experienced this tradition, I can say that it's, it is quite clear cut in the sense that you know that you have attained a certain level of attainment because the fetters are gone, because of certain things that are changed in the mind and the personality. In the Zen tradition, they have the concept of Satori, they have the concept of Kensho, and they have the concept of after Kensho, there is still practice beyond that to be done, which is basically integrating the experience that they consider to be enlightened, enlightenment within the, the active life, within the worldly life, so to speak, which means now they have this transcendental experience and now they're trying to integrate it into every moment. You also have to understand that they don't really have the concept of jhanas. As far as I know, they don't have the concept of jhanas and these levels of experience in the same way as we understand it here. They have the concept of zazen, you know, the, the idea of just watching the mind. So that's sort of a level of mindfulness in terms of the four foundations of mindfulness. And their understanding is at a certain point by watching the mind, and not holding on to anything, the mind stops. Now, they don't really get deeper into this and they use what are known as koans to then test if somebody has experienced some form of a enlightenment experience, as far as I understand it. But I don't know if they can be uh, equally comparable. They're probably just different approaches. And if the experiences are same, one can only know once one has experienced it. May sufferings once be sufferings free, and the feast trust feed us be. May the grieving share our grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus required for the acquisitions of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, Davis and Nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Dawson. Thank you, Guru. Thank you, Good, night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.